For a month, a British army has been under siege on the Tigris River at Kut al Amara, awaiting relief. And this week, that relief exhibition encounters the enemy. I'm Indy Nidell. Welcome to The Great War. 1915 had ended with the beginning of a Russian offensive in East Galicia and Bessarabia, though it was plagued by supply problems and saw troops nearly starving in the winter cold. Austria-Hungary was calling up close to a million middle-aged men to join the fight against both Russia and Italy. Morale in Italy was at an all-time low, and over on the Western Front, it was mostly quiet as the Germans beefed up their defenses and the Allies made big offensive plans for later in the new year. Compared to the months of October and November, late December and early January were pretty quiet in the field, but there was action, particularly on the Eastern Front. On New Year's Day, the Russians attacked on both the Stripa and Steer rivers, and there would be scattered attacks throughout the week, with a lot of casualties on both sides, but without any appreciable gain in territory. Indeed, on the 7th, the Russians stormed Chartorsk, with the result that 11,500 of them were cut down by German machine guns. This was all part of a big move by General Ivanov on a 400-kilometer front from the Pripyat marshes to the Romanian border. One source says this was to give the Allies time to consolidate forces at Salonika. And in the far north, the Russians were trying to push the Germans out of their positions between Riga and Dvinsk. And they were being clever. Constant local attacks deprived the Germans of the winter rest that Field Marshal von Hindenburg had promised them. On the Western Front, the action was much smaller, and people were still reeling from the huge offensives of last autumn. The first few days of the year saw artillery fighting in Belgium on the East Seer and near Merken. The British tried a night attack near Fellingne, which failed. German artillery blasted Ypres and Luz, and a long-range gun fired into Nancy, killing a couple of civilians. And in the Vosges, it was a week of artillery duels between the French and the Germans. It was basically business as usual. But there were big plans afoot, as I briefly mentioned last week. Although 1915 had certainly looked, on paper, like a far better year for the Central Powers than the Allies, the new year was in many ways looking up for the Allies. The Russians were overcoming their munitions crisis. The British were producing a land army, and they were also financing tons of imports, which were pretty much essential to the Allied war effort. Much of that from the neutral United States of America. As 1916 dawned, the British now had 38 infantry divisions, over one million men, and were ever expanding. France was still, as it had been the entire war, the dominant ally on land, with 96 divisions under General Joseph Joffre. And you couldn't deny that France had borne the brunt of the war on the Western Front. The battles that the British had been heavily involved in, like Luce or Neuve-Chapelle, were really only skirmishes when compared to the gargantuan French battles like Champagne and Artois. But the time was finally coming for a huge combined Anglo-French offensive in the West to be complemented with simultaneous Italian and Russian offensives in the South and the East. As I said last week, French General Joseph Joffre had decided that it would be near the River Somme. Also last week, I spoke about the new German defenses on the Western Front, but they too had big offensive plans. German Army Chief of Staff Erich von Falkenhayn could pretty much see that time was the one thing that was not on Germany's side. He also felt that Britain was his main enemy, but he couldn't get to them until he disposed of Britain's shield, the French Army. What to do about that? Well, Germany had the advantage in munitions production. And since artillery, used properly, caused 75% of all casualties, and since German artillery was substantially superior to French, that's what he was going to use. Tons and tons and tons of German artillery. And he was going to use it somewhere where he figured the French would just have to stay and be battered. Somewhere they would not retreat from. Falkenhayn's choice for that place was Verdun. A historic place, a fortress commanding the heights of the Meuse River, east of Paris, with a huge part in the mythology and history of France. He thought the French would have no choice but to defend it, and he would shell them to pieces. This did, in some ways, make sense. Even though in pre-war France, Verdun had been just about the strongest part of its defenses. But now, it jutted out in a salient, and was at least semi-open to attack from three sides, and from the German salient further south at Saint-Michel, Verdun's communications 
could be shelled. And if Falkenhayn's forces could take the heights east of the river, Verdun itself could be shelled. The German communications there were better than those of the French, who had a single uphill winding road. The Germans had air superiority, and a winter attack would also give a big advantage of surprise. Falkenhayn planned to bleed the French army to death at Verdun. Yep, total attrition. The French positions there were actually unprepared. It had been quiet there, and Joffrey had even weakened defenses there a lot after the war began. Funny enough, there was an inspection there in January 1916, and after that, the French generals would have likely abandoned the position. But French politicians said that the glory of France forbade withdrawal from Verdun. The German force was to be the 5th Army, under the command of Crown Prince Wilhelm, but he would only have nine divisions of men. Remember, this was all about artillery, and it would be sent to the front on 1,300 munitions trains over seven weeks. The date when the attack would begin was planned for next month, February 12th. Oddly enough, other Germans in the German High Command felt differently than Falkenhayn. The chief of the German Navy General Staff, Admiral Henning von Holzendorf, not to be confused with Austrian Konrad von Hotzendorf, he believed that his U-boats could knock Britain out of the war within the year. And later this month, the new commander-in-chief of the Imperial High Seas Fleet, Admiral Reinhard Scheer, stated that he believed he could bring the British fleet into the North Sea and he could beat it, opening the way to the British Isles. But that was in the future, and in the present, the British were seeing action far from the North Sea in Mesopotamia. This week saw the Battle of Sheikh Sa'ad on the Tigris River. Now, Charles Townsend's forces were under siege in Kut, right? The Ottomans had decided to starve them out after several offensive operations failed, and Lieutenant General Fenton Aylmer was heading upriver trying to relieve them. The winter rains and mud had rolled in though, and George Younghusband, which is a fantastic name, George Younghusband, leader of the advance team, had this to say. Having no cavalry or aeroplanes, and the country being flat as a billiard table. The only way of reconnoitering the Ottomans was to march on till we bumped into them. Which they did on the 6th. Young Husband's attacks that day failed, but the next day, Aylmer and the cavalry had caught up with them. The attacks that day began in a heavy fog, and by the end of the day, British and Indian forces had taken the right bank of the river and could flank the left bank. The Ottomans were forced to retreat upriver. Thing is, Though this was a victory, it was a real costly one for the British. 4,500 dead and wounded out of a force of 13,000. And they were far from their base at Basra and could not easily be replaced. And of course, each advance took them closer to the Ottoman base at Baghdad. And that was the week. Battles in Mesopotamia and on the Eastern Front. And scattered action in the West as the Germans prepare for a huge winter offensive. But think about that offensive. The plan was to basically be last man standing. That's what they were now reduced to as a battle plan. Just think about that. I got the following from Martin Gilbert's The First World War, a quote that I actually used last week, but I think it's important enough that I'm gonna use it again. It's from the historian Alistair Horne. Quote, never through the ages had any great commander or strategist proposed to vanquish an enemy by gradually bleeding him to death. The macabreness, the unpleasantness of its very imagery could only have emerged from and was symptomatic of that great war where, in their callousness, leaders could regard human lives as mere corpuscles." Unquote. The total anonymous lack of humanity of modern war. The dire situation for the British Indian Army in Mesopotamia began in late November. And if you'd like to find out more about that, you can check out that episode right here. Our Patreon supporter of the week is Where Is My Orange? Thanks to his or her support, we are on the way to reach our next goal on Patreon. You can support us on Patreon if you like, and you'll get cool perks in return. Don't forget to subscribe to our show and to our subreddit to never miss anything about our show. See you next time.